Hello and welcome to the Ecocast by Actual Tech Media. Today's topic, scanning the modern storage landscape from arrays to software to integrated systems and more. Thank you so much for joining us on this special event. We've got a great event lined up for you. You'll hear from experts at Pure Storage, Faction, and Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Now, before we get started, there's just a few things that you should know about today's Ecocast. First off, we want this to be an educational event. All of us at Actual Tech Media are former IT professionals ourselves. We know how tough it can be in the world of enterprise IT to solve your technology challenges. And we're here to help with innovative technology solutions and experts to answer your questions. So we encourage questions on this event. I'll be talking about our new best question prize in just a moment. But we encourage you to put your questions there in the questions tab and we'll be doing dedicated Q&A sessions with each of today's expert presenters and doing our best to respond to every question electronically during the event. I'll also have a few poll questions for you out there in the audience. We also have a number of resources in the handouts tab. I encourage you to check those out and download those resources. They won't be as readily available as they are now after the event. We also want this to be a social event. You can tweet directly from your console and the hashtag for today's event, ATM Ecocast, will be automatically appended. And finally, prizes. On today's Ecocast, we'll be announcing the winners of three Amazon $500 gift cards. You must be live in attendance to qualify. And there are some other legalese prize terms and conditions you should be aware of. You can find those there in the handouts tab. We also have our new for 2021 best question prize. This is for each of the three sessions on the event today. So get your questions in early and we'll be contacting the winners of the three Amazon $50 gift cards after today's presentations. To be eligible for the prize drawings, you must be live on the event at the time of the drawing. Winners have the option to make a donation to a selected charity and all prize winners must submit an IRS form W9 to Actual Tech Media. Through generous attendees who have won prizes, we have made donations to the charities you see on the screen. Over the years, that's added up to thousands of dollars in charity. If you would like to donate your prize value to charity when we contact you, just let us know. The hashtag for today's event is ATM Ecocast. I'll be monitoring that over on Twitter. Feel free to tweet, again, directly from the console. You can follow Actual Tech Media on Twitter and me, David M. Davis, as well. We encourage you to subscribe to all the Actual Tech Media channels on YouTube, Facebook, and the 10 on Tech podcast. We post all of our latest and greatest content over on LinkedIn, so make sure that you follow us there. Now, before we do a few introductory poll questions and I introduce you to our first expert presenter, I want to just talk about the state of storage in enterprise IT today. We are facing a lot of challenges out there. The state of enterprise IT is suffering from massively growing data sets. It just never seems to stop growing and we must have storage solutions to support these massively growing data sets. We also have more latency sensitive applications than ever before. And we seem to be separating our storage from the applications more than ever before as well. So latency and performance are critical these days. We're also suffering from aging storage systems. It seems that storage solutions just constantly need to be replaced, which is especially true as we learn about new and innovative, more efficient storage solutions like you'll learn about on the Ecocast today. We also have a ton of data security concerns with ransomware and malicious attacks. We need to be more sensitive than ever before about our data security. And then finally, we have this expectation of continuous uptime, 24 by seven. Our end users and clients expect our systems and our data to be available, placing the same expectations of Gmail and Facebook on our enterprise data sets and applications. So what are we in IT to do? What are the solutions to these modern storage challenges? Well, on the Ecocast today, you'll learn about new and innovative solutions that offer the kind of massive scalability that we're looking for, the incredible performance, things like flash storage and NVMe, cloud data services, cloud data protection, disaster recovery as a service, hyperconvergence, integrated systems, distributed HCI, and much more. So I'm excited for you to learn from our expert presenters at Pure Storage, Faction, and Hewlett Packard Enterprise. 
Now, before I introduce you to those presenters, I've got a few poll questions for you out there in the audience. Hopefully some fun questions for you to answer. I'll be sharing the results of each one of these with you so you can see how you stack up with your peers. All right, our first poll question is on the screen, and that is, are you using Software Defined Storage, or SDS? I'm curious to know the response to this, and I will share the result here with you. You can see how you, you know, compare to your fellow IT professionals on today's Storage Ecocast event. If you haven't done one of these polls before, you simply uh, select your response right there in the slides window. All right, thank you everyone who responded to that poll there. We do appreciate that. Let me share the results of this one. And uh, good split here. 38% said yes, using software-defined storage. 41% said no, and 20% not quite sure. Um, still learning about software-defined storage. All right, good info. Another question here, uh, what about silos? Do you feel that your storage is either all or in part still siloed? Again, simple yes, no, or not quite sure. All right, thank you to everyone who responded to that one. So 46% uh, said yes, still siloed, 24% no, and 28% not quite sure, uh, the storage infrastructure there. Another poll question, uh, what percent of your company's data do you feel like is stored in the cloud today? This is a simple percentage breakdown. Uh, followed by, we're not storing our data in the cloud today. And then I'm going to have a follow-up question to this one that says, you know, in the next 24 months, where do you see, uh, uh, do you see more uh, of your data being stored in the cloud, the same or, or less? All right, thank you to everyone who responded to this one. And of course, thank you to all the welcome and good morning messages from everyone out there across the United States and around the world in the questions tab. We do appreciate that. All right, let me share the results on this one. And 6% uh, said they're not using the cloud at all. Uh, and then there's a pretty good distribution there, all the way from you know 21% that, uh, I guess I should say 1% to 20% actually, 21% uh, on the low end, all the way up to 11% uh, have 80 to 100% of their data in the cloud. Good to know. And then what about the future? Say in the next couple of years, like what's your plan? Do you see more? Of your data, a higher percentage? Uh, do you see, you know, roughly the same, lower, or, hey, we're still not storing our data in the cloud. <laughs> I'm curious to see the results on this one, your plans for the future. I appreciate everyone participating in these polls. Hopefully it, it's of interest to you as well. We'll have a few other poll questions during the event. And I've got one more poll question to go before I introduce you to our first expert presenter. So now let me share the results of this one with you. And 64% said they'll be storing a greater percentage of their data in the cloud, 22% uh, roughly the same, 7% less, and 5% still uh, not planning to use the cloud for data storage. And then final poll question before I introduce you to the first presenter, and that is simply, what's your time frame for adding new storage or updating existing storage solutions at your company? We're all talking about uh, modern storage solutions on the Ecocast today, so just curious, you know, what's your time frame for making changes to your storage infrastructure or storage lineup? All right, thank you to everyone who responded to that poll and all the other polls in the lineup here. And with that, it's time to kick off today's Ecocast. I'm excited to introduce Mr. Jay Cuthrell, Vice President of Solutions at Faction. Jay, thanks for being here. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Also, that poll was pretty interesting. Two out of three attendees today are gonna to be moving their storage into the clouds. So with that, I wanna get started off. What we're gonna talk about today is convergence the inevitable pedal path to multi-cloud. And uh, if you don't know about Faction, here's a quick overview. Founded in 2006, currently operating in nine cloud locations. We have thousands of end customers, uh, all of those taking advantage of the storage they're putting closer to, more adjacent to cloud service providers to talk about in just one moment. 
We do have a growing number of patents and our expertise. Uh, we have some great partnerships with folks like Dell Technologies, VMware, AWS, uh, GCP, o OCI, Azure, all of the major cloud service providers. So if you don't know much about me, I'm also uh, on Twitter at jqthrill. Got my email here. I joined Faction in December of last year, uh, which for those of you keeping track, I think the, uh, I don't know what, what week that is in March, that just kind of extended out into uh, December of 2020. But I came to Faction from roughly 25 years of prior career. I'd also been at companies like Dell Technologies, EMC, VCE, Acadia, Qthrow.com, my own consulting group, Digitel, Neonova, Scient, IXL back in the dot-com days, as well as if you're familiar with Telecom, Nortel, and uh, Analyst International, and IBM. I do have a blog at fudge.org. Mostly the content comes out on a periodic basis because mostly I'm just interested in headless content management systems and CIC pipelines that you can get from whether it's uh, GitHub through the Microsoft uh, side or even Netlify for doing things like um, basic kind of push, cl push, click, and go. So let's get into it. First, we're going to start with some definitions. And again, this is about convergence. So we'll talk about what it means to say something is uh, converged or converging. And so when we think about that, it's the convergence of these lines in the distance. So convergence as a use of a word over time has certainly been on the increase. And we're going to talk about multi-cloud, and that's clearly on the increase as well. So let's start with some history. If we take a walk down convergence lane starting in 2005, this was a time when, if you can think back that far, a lot of disassembly. You, you had virtualization on the rise. You had people buying storage arrays, various forms of compute, and networking fabrics. And along that time, same timeline, in 2006, a company that was mostly known for other things created something called Amazon Web Services. And then, strangely enough, right around the corner in Denver, Colorado, a LLC was formed as well. By 2010, the consolidation and convergence that occurred in virtualization, storage, compute, and networking fabrics. And now we had something called converged infrastructure. Also from your poll, some of you are also aware that software-defined storage and even software-defined networking were coming into being, as well as more terms like public cloud and private cloud were being used. It was also around the same time that Microsoft Azure launched into the public cloud space with their offer. And if you're familiar with any of the uh, direct connectivities or peering agreements that are possible with cloud service providers, AWS Direct Connect was also launched shortly thereafter. And along that same time frame, uh, the company now known as Faction also went through its own renaming and got some funding. Five years later, now we have the combination of converged infrastructure and some of those software-defined storage concepts and the networking in software-defined coming together, and that formed another category called converged and hyper-converged infrastructure. We now see public and private cloud being also joined by hybrid cloud. And then the public cloud providers, the, the cloud service providers that operate under the brands of Google, now Amazon, Azure, they're all doing their own versions of that original AWS Direct Connect. Now Azure has Express Route, Google now has a new partner interconnect. And along the same time frame, Faction comes into being and starts to expand its data center footprint around the globe. By 2020, again, the year we just escaped, that seemed like the longest march ever on record. We now have the collapsation, you know, again, we're converging yet again. We have conversion, hyperconverged, and hybrid cloud, and those concepts now coming together and being known as autonomous or composable infrastructure, or some people refer to it as infrastructure as code. And interestingly enough, this is also when Faction starts talking more about cloud data services for multi-cloud. By 2025, just kind of looking out ahead, Really what this will be about is another kind of combination, another convergence where AI and machine assistance, human and machine partnerships will actually take more uh, advantage of what's possible in the DevOps field, DevSecOps as well. And by that point, we won't be talking about uh, necessarily just one company like Faction, for example. We actually believe and see that there will be a ubiquitous cloud data service that's available across all the cloud providers or ubiquitous cloud data services for multi-cloud. Um, throughout the presentation, if there are references, I'll actually have source, colon, and then those blue links. If uh, you're clicking on this at home, you can actually click those links. Uh, some of that will drive to the history of faction and a couple of blog posts I've used to kind of uh, make a record of some of these years. So just continuing, 
we'll go into some of the stories around what a cloud first goal is. Some of you have had cloud first goals where you are, maybe you're going to have one soon. You're looking for scalability, you're looking for agility, you're looking for paper use, you're looking for the resilience of the public cloud. And that's very admirable. Usually what happens is when a customer or a client uh, would take on that single cloud example we're gonna go through, you start with that cloud first strategy. You have that single vendor, the good enough access, it satisfies a lot of those things that you were trying to accomplish with those cloud first goals. You get in, it's easy, it's inexpensive, what's not to love? Well, then you operate for a, maybe a year, maybe it's uh, less than a year, but you start to realize, wow, there's a lot of innovation happening. And maybe that innovation isn't actually happening only with the existing single cloud provider that I'm using right now. Maybe there's a better service or a more interesting service you see with another provider, but you feel a little bit locked into that original cloud or that contract that you got into. So again, some of the lessons you might learn in just that first example where we're talking about a cloud first goal, your data may not be accessible from your cloud of choice for what you want to do, whatever that innovative service is. Maybe it's a little more expensive than it was to get in to repatriate your data to get it in and out of uh, those clouds. Now you're looking at potentially bills that stack up quite high if you do change your mind. And along that same time frame, because someone saw uh, something in your organization, they said, hey, I think that might be a better cloud for us to go try. You're probably now actually using two different cloud providers. And that's actually on average. So if you look at Flexera's 2020 State of the Cloud Report, also hyperlinked uh, below, you can see that a lot of organizations are already starting down that path. So, okay, what's, what's, what else is out there? What are we seeing? Well, first and foremost, the innovation trends and challenges that customers, if you uh, click this study from Gartner for trends that are impacting cloud adoption for 2020, a lot of customers are realizing they spend a little bit more than they thought they were going to. Uh, some of those terms like private cloud I had mentioned before, they're actually accelerating that because they're exiting or evacuating data centers that they operated prior to that. Uh, some of that private cloud off-premises, uh, that type of story is actually starting to resonate. We're not quite at the halfway mark, we're, we're getting there. A lot of the customers are realizing that they actually need a little bit more than just a public cloud offer. Uh, so they're looking for other things. Can I get a specific unique set of security performance or, or management? Other things that come up, hybrid, repatriating workloads, going from what was the large hyperscaler or the public uh, cloud service providers, bringing something back, moving things back, having optionality. So a lot of different motions taking place. So if we look at this from a different point of view, let's take a data first goal. So a data first goal would mean that we're looking for innovation and that means we're looking at multiple clouds. We're gonna leverage everything. So leverage everything via multi-cloud. We want to have a very effective data sovereignty strategy, make sure we have unique privacy requirements or country specific requirements, regional or otherwise, we can satisfy those. We also want to unify, we, we maybe don't want to think about private, public, we just, we want to unify what it means for us in our cloud you know, strategy, because we now have a data first goal, not a cloud first goal. And lastly, because we're talking about multi-cloud, we're inherently avoiding a innovation lock-in specific to one cloud vendor. So with that in mind, what is multi-cloud? Well, simply put, it's using more than one cloud for the purpose of gaining advantages that would otherwise be unobtainable if you just had that cloud for a single cloud approach. Okay, seems simple enough. Certainly, certainly, I, I think if you've ever been on Twitter or you have email, you've probably gotten offers to sign up free with every single one. Um, this is just a collection. Um, you've got AWS in here, you've got Azure, you've got Google, IBM's tweeting out, you get cloud light for free for up to 40 services. And then you've got Oracle, very recent entry uh, where they're now saying, you know, it's basically free for life for a certain tier. And there's going to be more, there's going to be more coming soon. Each one of them is going to have its own pace of innovation. So let's take a step back and ask the question, well, when, well, if you listen to Gartner, this is uh, Santosh who coined this, not a matter of when um, it's not a, question of if it's a matter of when, his point of view was you're still getting all the benefits from that cloud consumption model, that operating modality. The difference is, is now you're, you're avoiding the risk of an innovation lock-in to a single cloud. Uh, to contrast that, if you believe that this is actually a quote from William Gibson, there is a, there is a quote investigator link if you want to click that. The future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And so for, for, for my purposes today on this and what I'm wanting to share with you is this is something that is absolutely in the permission space. It is real. It is here. And 
With that in mind, here are the four key themes that you will note as we go into 2021 and beyond. Certainly, cloud spending is accelerating. That was evidenced also by some of the poll results we saw earlier when we started this event. Two out of three companies are going to need more than just one cloud. We're also seeing consolidation of legacy data centers. Sometimes that means you expand. Maybe if you had five, you have to run six or seven because those sixth and seventh ones are actually very nice uh, approaches, not, not uh, encumbered by legacy. And so you actually have to go to six or seven before you can consolidate down to two or three. And also, you start to realize that where you place your data, where you place the data is about how advantageous can, it be, can I be about placing the data, the essential company data, so that when I do want to unlock or see some of the innovation that's out there, I don't have to re, you know, rehydrate, dehydrate, move it from point A to point B and pay you know, fees associated with that transfer. So, and again, why would we want to move things? Because the innovation that's driving data use is nonstop. Uh, this is from Cloud Pegboard. Um, this is my, uh, my, my uh, get out of whatever free card because I put a plus in the front of everything because as soon as I create the chart, I'm kind of wrong. And so every time there's an AWS, you know, next, next event or an Azure event or Google um, does a press release, these numbers just go up. So Amazon, well over 300. Microsoft, well over 200. Google, well over 100. There's, there's Oracle in this one too, and then dot, dot, dot. There's other clouds. They're all going to innovate. And so we all want to participate, take advantage of that innovation, but we don't necessarily want to commit to just one story of where the innovation might come from. And so Faction's view is that there is an inevitable path to multi-cloud. And so our position is you keep your data central single copy. You use this thing called a Faction Cloud Control Volume. And whether it's a smaller, a larger volume, you need multiple protocol access, you need replication between on-premises or another data center, we're talking about connecting over something called the Faction Internet Network Exchange. And so, you know, whether it's AWS Direct Connect or Azure's Express Route or Google Cloud's Partner Interconnect, we're making all those things possible or even Oracle's Fast Connect. All of those things are brought through the fax, uh, the, the fix. And then Faction's cloud data services layer into that. So when you want to take advantage of a specific innovation cycle from one of these cloud service providers, you're attaching to the same storage you kept in that single place that's managed and maintained by Faction. And so here's a, a tangible example. Let's say, for example, you were interested in doing multi-cloud genomic analysis. This is something called Project Triumph. If you're curious about that, it was presented at BioIT World 2020 last year. And if uh, you look at this chart, you may say, well, okay, um, I see in blue at the bottom, I see, okay, there's the Faction Cloud Control Volume, the CCV, and there's this repository. And that single you know, file repository really gives you the couple of benefits of, first, it's centralized scale out. It's going to give you access to, in this instance, thousands of genomes. And because you went that morning and said, gosh, I wonder what, you know, for example, a spot instance is going to cost me to get some GPUs, you realize, woo, great price, but um, I, I don't know if I can get all of my, that I need for this particular project. So you really, if you're going to have an arbitrage approach, you need to have a strategy um, because the opportunistic instances, they're going to vary. And getting reliable capacity can be kind of challenging. So the goal is, how can I get all of the GPUs I would ever possibly need? I'm probably going to have to go to more than just one of these cloud service providers. So in this example, you're getting a bunch of GPUs from Google, you're getting a bunch from Azure, and you get a bunch from AWS. And you're able to now leverage that multi-cloud access to that single repository, thousands of genomes. You're, now cut, you're, you're getting hundreds of GPUs, over a million CUDA cores. And this is important, and, and, and here's another piece of that. So let's say you get more GPUs one day from the other. You, know, you think about the connectivity required and what, what, it, what it would mean if you could change your mind in that, in that context. And that's what we call fungible multi-cloud connectivity. Again, that faction internetwork exchange is doing a few things. So when you think about a data service, you're associating that with throughput, right? When we want to allocate to one provider or another provider, or at the part in gray at the bottom, let's say I just changed my mind. I want to do something over the internet. It's the ability to resize, reallocate throughput on demand. And that's across any of the cloud service providers or the internet. And so your result is that now your cloud data services that you want to mix and match, those are ready for multi-cloud. And uh, if you're curious about any of this, there's a, there's a link to the, the Faction portal, as well as the Faction patents that we've talked about early in this presentation. Um, but one th last thing I'm going to leave you with is some lessons learned. So if you, if you don't use that uh, multi-cloud data-first principle, 
you're going to be challenged in a couple of areas, uh, job management, how you do scratch page or output collation, um, source data, and basically ease of use. So, you know, without uh, job management, it will be a little more complex um, in terms of scratch page and collation. There's a lot more manual steps there. Um, in terms of source data, you're looking again at those costs between keeping copies or doing egress back and forth, as well as the ease of use patterns for your tool chains where you're making changes on a per cloud basis. Alternatively, if you look at Faction Multi-Cloud, we're simplifying because we're using a single shared file system. That's, that's that single repository we saw on the prior page. If you think about what we do in terms of collation, there is no collation required because it's a single shared high performance environment. In terms of the source data, because it's single copy and you can access from any of the clouds, it means that you're really just thinking this as a simple network attachment motif. And then in terms of ease of use, it should go without saying that you keep your workflow, you uh, don't have to change anything. And if you do want to change something, that change is made in effect for all clouds at the same time. I know I've gone very fast, but we've uh, run out of time and we're now in the QA section. So if you have any questions, let me know. I'll be watching for questions. Absolutely, yeah. Great presentation, Jay. I really enjoyed that. We got a lot of good questions for you coming in as well. Uh, while we do that, I'm just going to bring up a poll for everyone out there in the audience. I want to call your attention to it says what additional information would you like about the faction solution so um let's see one of the questions i saw that came in jay um from manoj here who's asking uh, if you have any lessons uh, from previous you know cloud projects uh that you'd like to share with us you know lessons learned best practices anything like that yeah i think it's easy to underestimate just how much data gravity exists. And if you're not familiar with the term data gravity, uh, Dave Mercury coined that, I think, almost uh, 10 years ago. Boy, we're all getting older, aren't we? And what I think he was hinting at when he started down that path, I don't know if you realized it, but data gravity has expressed itself quite evidently. So when you do put a lot of information, you know, company data into one of these cloud service providers, liberating that data from that cloud service provider can be quite challenging. And so, um, again, two out of three of the attendees today said they're going to be taking their storage to the cloud. But I think what actually is going to take place, it's going to be, you know, taking it place to clouds because all of those different innovation centers are going to come from more than just one cloud service provider. So I would encourage anyone thinking about putting more of their data into cloud to think about it in terms of putting data into things that are accessible by multiple clouds. And so, again, that faction story of thinking in, of a central single repository approach whenever possible really will give you the, the best bang for your buck, uh, give you the most um, ability to change your mind, take advantage of different centers of innovation and the rapid pace that we're seeing in the industry today. Excellent. And so are you saying there's a couple questions here around this? Uh, essentially, the, if folks are interested in using multi-cloud and leveraging the benefits of multi-cloud, that Faction can kind of be the single point of management for that? That's certainly an approach. And obviously, I'm a little biased because I work for Faction now, but that's what I would say is uh, think of it in terms of when you know you're going to be taking advantage of at least two cloud service providers. I think a, a, a cloud data services for multi-cloud approach is really sensible. Um, again, using a data-first approach as opposed to a cloud-first approach in your principles. Excellent. And then uh, there's a question here from uh, Sachin around uh, running databases in the cloud. Uh, do you have any recommendations for that? There, uh, another question is asking if there are, are alternatives to AWS Redshift or what do you recommend for running databases in the cloud? Yeah, a great question. We've actually got customers that do databases. We have folks that are doing um, different file systems for their data and analytics platforms. It really comes down to working closely with the solutions engineering team to understand exactly what performance metrics you have to have, whether that's a, uh, something that requires sharding, uh, whether that's something that requires uh, in attenuation of uh, what IOPS are required and when, you know, so kind of like how, how high of a performance of tier is required for you to satisfy the requirements. Um, those are all key things to work through. Just like all the cloud service providers have their own tiers of storage, uh, the way Faction approaches its cloud data services multi-cloud, we're also thinking in terms of higher performance. And when those higher performance requirements are uh, an absolute necessity, uh, we want to make sure that we're absolutely pairing the best possible solution to the use case. Got it. Okay. And then I like this question they're asking, what's the best way to have data-first goals 
within an organization that's still working on cloud first goals? Great question. I would say it's, it's important not to think in terms of amounts. It's important to think a lot like that prior question. Start with the use cases, reach out to all of the stakeholders within the application space within the company, people that run or maintain either systems of engagement or systems of record or known business applications that are uh, either core or mission critical to the business and its ability to execute. Make sure you're gathering all of the views, bringing all of those views together, and then assess and prioritize uh, what some people call rationalize, rationalize the data sets that you know absolutely are targets for multi-cloud service provider innovation opportunities. Um, for example, uh, I think you mentioned a couple of there, but uh, there might be examples where today you're looking at, say, Google's BigQuery product. Maybe next time you're looking at uh, Synapse or other things from Azure. Obviously, Oracle has its own innovation pace that it's going to uh, execute with. And, and last but not least, if you also want to consider what AWS is, you know, again, that sheer volume, 300 plus and growing, there will be more opportunities because each time a new innovation occurs, someone will look back at the data that's available within the institution and say, what could we learn? And some of that data is in a, uh, a, a kind of like a rear view mirror. Some of it is streaming in real time every single day. And so as you go through the different Vs of data, the velocity, veracity, volume, all those, all those Vs still come into play, but that's a data first view, not a cloud first view. Great advice, great advice. Um, what happens when the single copy repository actually needs to be in different regions around the world is the next question. Great question. And one of the things that we're always looking for is uh, great technologies that assist with site-to-site -site replication, uh, different scenarios that allow for seeding. So uh, some examples might be how would you get uh, petabytes of information from point A to point B. And in some instances, you're using seeding equipment to do that for the large bolt piece, and then you're looking at all your deltas on the second pass and then uh, continuing to keep things in communication. All the connectivity we're talking about are uh, typically uh, large, large uh, capacity pipes. And so speed of light, physics are a thing. I think you may have seen that uh, picture on one of my charts about the four key trends where I uh, showed Einstein's face and the speed of light versus the speed of your business. Uh, we all have to contend with physics. So a big part of our business is also ensuring that when customers do need to have a replication strategy for large corpus, we're anticipating that everything from protocol streamlining to uh, non-obvious uh, non uh, ways of uh, getting things from point A to point B without the overhead of TCP, for example. A lot of solutions in this industry today, and the innovation only continues, as well as the uh, uh, cross-planet uh, uh, capacity, and eventually we'll be having interstellar conversations if you read my last blog post that I linked to on the front page. Uh, maybe we're not there today uh, for this call, but there will absolutely be uh, data centers and uh, repositories in the sky. Awesome. That's cool. I look forward to that. Um, next question is about egress fees. They're asking, you know, are there cloud service providers today uh, that have removed egress fees? And kind of what do you see around that for the future? Yeah, it's an interesting story. When you think back to the earliest days, I, I, I would say uh, the size of the, the data sets that were getting moved back and forth, it was, it was kind of kept quiet, like hey, maybe no one will notice. Well, the, the data is so large now, it's almost impossible not to notice. So if you, if you do look at your bill, uh, depending on the cloud service provider, you will see some types of fees related to egress. Um, so, you know, Getting things in and out, uh, sometimes getting in is very easy. Getting out can be a very expensive proposition. That would be the cliche. Each of the cloud service providers is, is taking a different approach in how they position. Um, it's important to uh, closely examine your bill, obviously. Uh, I would also say that you're going to find that as tagging improves in the network designs and the technology that are used by the cloud service providers, you may find certain traffic will be given a a pass, if you will, uh, meaning that they have like a toll pass. So if you, if you think about it in those terms, uh, certain replication for certain technologies with technology partners within the cloud service provider, those are probably going to be waived fees because they're tagged, uh, they're accurately accounted for in the cost model for the cloud service provider. And so to you, the downstream consumer, the end user, that type of a back and forth fee wouldn't show up. Over time, I, uh, I go back to the old school telecom days. I remember when people paid for long distance and then something happened called voice over IP 
uh, something called competition in the industry, and that drove down the cost of long distance to a, to a really interesting set of rates. And so on a long-term basis, I, I don't absolutely uh, agree that there will always be egress fees. I think they will fade away into the value uh, that's delivered on a, on a monthly recurring basis uh, by the cloud service providers. I also think there'll be key partnerships. There'll be um, interconnect and peering agreements, and that'll benefit the end user because right now I think what happens in uh, the, the egress fee business is cloud service providers charge what the market will bear. And I think that over time, again, as customers start putting more and more of their information into these innovation centers and taking advantage of it, egress fees will start to fall away. Very interesting. Yeah, I, I hope for that as well. I hope that happens because that uh, that could help a lot of companies, uh, give them more flexibility when moving data out of the cloud and to other Absolutely. providers perhaps. Yeah. Um, and then there's a couple questions here around cloud security, uh, concerns around cloud security. What advice do you have uh, for folks who are considering migrating to the cloud, but they're concerned about security? Yeah, the good news is most cloud service providers today will have at least a dedicated portion of their website that outlines everything from uh, whether they have specific industry certifications related to security. Uh, maybe they have high trust as a compliance um, certification. If they're doing work with, say, the federal government in the United States, uh, for those of you internationally listening to us, uh, those examples would be FISMA, FedRAMP, um, whether or not they're a, a trusted cloud, other initiatives that are related to this. And then um, in some cases, those will be adopted by other countries, Canada, Australia, around the world. But I think it's important to also pay attention to things like NIST standards. So whether it would be like NIST 500-83, which I think is in Rev 5, all of the cloud service providers will be competing for uh, all of the ISO certifications, the various cloud uh, trust initiative certifications. It will only improve over time. And I think that's the primary benefit, again, of having a data first principle where you can look at the various innovation centers, decide what your sovereignty policy is for your data as opposed to trying to just keep track of which cloud provider you want to commit to in a single cloud or a cloud first strategy, think about a data first strategy, let your data sovereignty needs drive the cloud service providers that you can work with. Excellent. Yeah, good advice. And then here's a good question, I think, probably to, to kind of wrap up with here, because um, we're running out of time in our Q&A, and they're asking, how do, you dif how do you differentiate a faction from the big public clouds like AWS, Google, and Azure. If someone's looking at going directly to AWS, why would they be working with Faction instead? Great question. I would say a, a really interesting example might be, let's say you go in, you're using a specific software-defined storage product, or you're using a storage product uh, within a tier within uh, one of the native clouds. You start looking at the price you're paying for the amount of storage, how often you're using it, and you realize that, wow, this is these instances are lasting a lot longer than I thought. We're actually using a higher tier of storage that's very expensive, a lot longer than I thought. And you, you'll look at that number and you'll say, gosh, you know, on a, on a one-year, two-year, three-year basis, what would it be like if I had the same cost and economics of what I associated when I would sweat an asset or a storage array, and I could get the best of both worlds? And then also if I change my mind and move my compute to another cloud service provider or a, a third cloud service provider, how do I not have to deal with those um, switching costs? And that's a, that's a great example of where Faction is highly competitive. Um, it's a very interesting niche that we operate in today because it's cloud data services for multi-cloud. If you look for other players in that space, um, there's not a lot of other players like Faction. And I, I believe over time there will be an absolute uh, sheer uh, gargantuan number of Faction-like offers that exist in the industry. That absolutely is the progression. That's where things have to go. That'll be our validation of the market we're creating. But um, that's how I would see it is it's when you start to look at the storage and how you're accessing centers of innovation and the longevity and the, in the access frequency of that information, your data, your, that you know is your data that you need to have access to and unleash and unlock innovation against it. Um, that's where faction comes to mind. Excellent. Excellent. Well said. All right. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have in our live Q&A, Jay, but there's some more technical questions there for you in the queue that we didn't have Great. time for. Thank you so much for being on. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate the time investment. Cheers. And for more information on Faction, visit factioninc.com. And Jay has been uh, nice enough to uh, supply his entire deck there in the handouts tab. If you want to download uh, Jay's deck, 
uh, you can do that. It's also got his contact information on it if you'd like to follow up with uh, other questions uh, after the event. So make sure that you check out that handout and, of course, visit factioninc.com for more information. And with that, it's time for our first Amazon $500 gift card drawing. This gift card is going out to Henry uh, Zia, I guess it's pronounced X-I-A, from Massachusetts. Congratulations, Henry X from Massachusetts. Uh, two more gift cards still to give out on the event today, so stay tuned. And of course, keep those good questions coming in because we're also announcing our best question prizes after the event. And now I'm excited to introduce you to our next presenters on today's EcoCast event. Welcome Mr. Andrew Miller, Principal Systems Engineer at Pure Storage, and Mr. Errol Hayward, Senior Marketing Solutions Manager at Pure as a Service. Andrew and Errol, great to have you on. Let's go to a video and take it away. Thanks, David. And Actual Tech has been really cool to see how Actual Tech has changed and grown over the years and even the conversations that we've had. Really also love the topic today of scanning the modern storage landscape from arrays to software to integrated systems. We've actually got a good number of thoughts about that along the lines of simplicity, speed, and flexibility. We're, we're going to claim that it's unmatched. Hopefully we'll make those promises come true. My name is Andrew Miller. I'm joined today by Errol Hayward. Really appreciate your having us. Uh, before we get to introductions, we'll do that. What we're going to go through today, we're going to be in a little bit of turbo mode, hopefully not too fast, but keeping it higher energy relatively wandering through kind of the origin story of how we can help facilitate your journey to a true hybrid cloud, you know, simplicity and flexibility are key themes, new dimensions of flexibility as a service, and then even going up stack. That's where we're wandering to whole stack and flash stack. In case we haven't had the pleasure of meeting, as I mentioned, I'm Andrew Miller. I'm principal SE here at Pure Storage. In the past, you know, I've wandered from seven years on the customer side, kind of admin to engineer to architect, partner side, SE to manager, director. You make promises on the whiteboard. If they come true, you get to come back. Otherwise, not. A little bit of a detour, building out a tech marketing team. And uh, the, this community, actually, is, in, in, is a large actual tech community is near and dear to my heart. And it's part of why I leave the, the 9X V expert on there. And for better or worse, this may be the only kangaroo picture that you'll see today. Hopefully that's a happy thought. You know, I'm a real person and there's, there's been fun memories over the time. So I like to use those for the profile. Errol, do you mind introducing yourself? So, cool. hey, thank you, Andrew. Really appreciate the, uh, the uh, uh, opportunity to, to be here and do this webinar at Actual Tech. My name is Errol Hayward. I'm a senior marketing solutions manager here at Pure. Um, I've, I've been in marketing for quite a while. So, you know, it's not my first time uh, around the block here. You know, my two favorite things, music and food. I, I just want to, you know, kind of highlight, um, you know, some some uh, some cool meals I've had lately. Um, you know, you're probably wondering what the heck that is. I mean, that is a fried egg on a bed of caviar. It's awesome. Thanks. I'm glad to be here and looking forward to uh, speaking to the rest of the folks. So we were talking about how, man, I'm, I'm, I'm a principal. I see I'm, I'm comfortable with my title. I have, but that's an amazing title right there. So, you know, hey, that's why I'm glad you're here because you got a lot of depth. That's cool. Okay. Looking back, how we got here, this is what I want to call a little bit of a history of flexibility. And if you're not familiar with Pure, this is really a little bit of a history of Pure. You look at the last 10 years of Pure, the first decade, if you will, was about reinventing the storage array or even kind of the storage experience, as you will. You know, we're moving towards storage as a service, like it says there, but, but going back in time with me for a minute. It started with, in some ways, what did customers not like about storage? And I used to live this as a customer, as a partner. You know, you had the procurement process with crazy long quotes, very complex implementation that might need professional services. You call into support, you got to set aside half a day, and it's only for break fix, and it's not super helpful even. And you're constantly paying a technology tax as you want to get new technologies in. You're doing forklift upgrades. You're migrating your data. You're taking downtime. This is the way it is just because that's the way it's always been. So pure sought, how do we flip that around? through each stage of that life cycle, right? From procurement to simple installation to proactive support to never having to migrate your data. That's non-disruptive and evergreen. But the inflection point for Pure, the starting of Pure, was Flash, right? Back then, all Flash was a little bit of a crazy thought. But we knew as Pure, and this goes to some of the co-founders, I've been here about two years, they actually knew that folks would come. They would try a new product for the performance, especially when it was an order of magnitude better. But eventually, that would be a more nuanced difference. We've done hard engineering over the years, but they'd stay for the simplicity, the simplicity throughout that entire life cycle. 
The only way that you do that in an enduring way is you make some really hard architectural decisions, and then you play out those decisions over time and improve and morph those. Things like the best data reduction pipeline, inline and post-process, stateless controllers that are paired up with actually how we handle the performance and even going into streamlined code paths. That's what gives the underpinning to say, I can change in and out any component without taking downtime and without performance impact. You don't just get to do that for free. That takes hard engineering work. We've done that from a hardware standpoint, controllers, chassis, flash modules. We, as pure, we don't actually buy SSDs. We buy the raw NAND and make our own modules for that, if you will. That's what's led to something like this. We have customers that literally, since they started, They've been able to upgrade and change every single component of their pure storage platform, and I say platform intentionally, without taking downtime and without having to migrate data. And we're now at the point where we don't, it's not just talking about the coal architecture, but it's actually we can talk about seven nines at a fleet wide basis. The vast majority of pure customers are actually 100% uptime. It's the ones that have some downtime. We're not perfect, right? But that actually pull it down to seven nines, which is pretty amazing because we're not doing the cheat card of taking out forklift upgrades and data migrations and plan downtime, that kind of thing. On top of that, we built a business model. This business model goes toward, this is getting more toward as a service and it's a platform and not a product. Some of the things that I put it, I usually call out here is like flat and fair. There's not the maintenance spike at year four that you would commonly expect. And it's like, well, do I upgrade or just pay a lot of maintenance on the old stuff? Eh. But we also make that possible by the hard engineering reducing flash failure rates. Without that, this wouldn't be possible. Beyond that, there's also the concept of flexibility in that all software is included on Pure Race. So sometimes it's hard to predict the future or maybe even impossible, right? What pro capabilities do I need in a year or two that are separate line items, have separate SKUs and separate licenses? So whether that's actually, you know, the flash module is getting smaller. We've included things like active cluster. That's like synchronous replication. That's not simple and not free on other platforms. And even the whole Pure One platform, that's what's led us into storage that works like software as a service like it says there you know deploy once you're upgrading in place without downtime without migration with performance you're modernizing over time over multiple generations and of course investment protection there's some great business data points there too uh, whether you like gartner or any analyst or not seven years and there's even a little bit of a fun story here. Usually, this top section is usually kind of clustered together. We're, we're stoked that this year, Pure Storage, in a combined hard general storage and SSD, it's a general storage quadrant, is clearly far and away out furthest from a completeness of vision and ability to execute, even against some companies that are a lot bigger. They've got giant supply chains and huge lines of credit. We've kept a focus on customers, and this is up to an executive level by virtue of what we call net promoter score. It's how you can actually measure this. If you haven't looked into this, this is a certified independent thing. It goes from zero to positive 100 to negative 100. Pure is in the top 1% of B2B companies and even like exceeds like some products that we all love, like the iPhone and even Uber and Tesla, that kind of stuff. That's led into a large and growing customer, customer base that continues to grow, constant milestones from a technology standpoint, thanks to a high investment from an R&D perspective. Which pulls me back around to the goal of Pure was not just to say reinvent the storage array, but to help storage work as much as possible on-prem, still physical gear, like software as a service. Now, that led us very logically into what about the financial flexibility? Because even if you can do things with, say, depreciation schedules that are over five or six or seven years instead of three years and thinking TCO and ROI, there's a whole as a service component there, which is where I love that Errol's joining me today because this is what he focuses on and part of why he's here. So, Errol, please, please feel free to add anything that I left out and take it away. Definitely. Hit the next slide, please. So you were speaking about software as a service. So I would bet that pretty much everyone listening to us right now has some type of software as a service in their business, period. I mean, you know, it gives, you know, great your business a lot of flexibility, a lot of scalability and choice. But I would also bet that if you look a little bit more specifically at storage as a service, the number is going to be a little bit less, right? So, but analyst firms like IDC are right now predicting, you know, a lot of growth in, in organizations using the old um, as a service consumption models. And, and over the next couple of years, because I mean, of the financial flexibility it brings, the simplicity it brings, and also the operational efficiency that it brings. So, 
you know, we recognized that, that trend, obviously, here at uh, Pure as a Service a few years back, and then we came up with Pure as a Service. Um, and, and so, next slide. So let me, let me go into a little bit more detail about what Pure as a Service actually is. I mean, it's a portfolio of, of uh, storage and data protection services with, you know, all the infrastructure, all the software, all that is owned and operated by Pure Storage. And, you know, with, with Pure as a Service, you can consume block, um, you know, file an object. Um, you, you, you consume all of that as a single unified subscription, you know, on premise or through a, a service provider or in, in the public cloud. But, you know, a big thing there is without the large upfront cost and, and without having to uh, do upgrade, to do expansions and, and, and monitoring or, or like the operational work of a typical CapEx uh, 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 model. Next slide. Feels like it's all about flexibility almost. All about <laughs> flexibility, definitely. So, you know, you know, Pure the Service is a really true on-demand storage service with enterprise features, meaning that it's not a lease. You know, leases have a lot less flexibility than what than what we we are offering here. And you know, that's a really important distinction because you know, with Pure as a Service, you never have to worry about running out of storage or overpaying for storage because um you know, you pay only for what you use as, as your consumption goes up or down, you know, it's, it's not about what you provision, it's about what you have actually used. Next slide. And then, you know, when we, when we thought about um, creating Pure as a Service, we really thought long and hard about the uh, customer experience. We thought about the cloud economics and cloud operations. I mean, all this was top of mind for us as, as we designed Pure as a Service. So, and, and we designed it um, with the hyperscaler experience in mind. You know, our goal was, was to deliver the, the, the same customer experience that you would get from like an AWS or, or an Azure with the uh, policy-based management. And, and, it was, and it was regardless, again, of whether you had it in your data center, you know, with a, a managed service provider or, or a co-location facility. You know, you get a consistent and, and unified experience with, with um, uh, your hybrid cloud. So again, from an economic benefits perspective, um, you know, we really saw many organizations look at as a service models primarily from an economic benefits um, perspective uh, because of the uh, capacity and performance um, available on demand. But, but this also eliminates costs, it eliminates uh, risk and, and waste associated with over uh, under provisioning. So again, you know, more, more flexibility, right? Um, and from an operational perspective, you know, peers of service is different as well. I mean, you would think that it would make sense for the people who built the technology to manage the technology, you would think <laughs> from hardware and software upgrades to forecasting to, to resource planning, you know, all of this is included with, with peers of service. And the only thing that your staff really has to, to worry about or, or really needs to do is to um, provision a volume. So, you know, there's no refresh required. Um, there's no, uh, you know, migrating your content off of, of one array to another. Uh, there's no constant set of, of management issues that you have to worry about. We take care of all of that uh, behind the scene. Next slide. So the, go ahead. I love it. I, just, I, I love the operational aspect there and the simplification because ops teams are getting asked to do so much more every day. It's not about taking things away. It's about freeing them up to do what they need to. So please keep going. Exactly. exactly. Cool. All right. So, so a little bit more detail. So the, the model is based on, on two components. There's a, a reserve capacity and an on-demand capacity. And let me talk a little bit about on-demand capacity first. You know, this is uh, the true meaning of pay-as-you-go consumption model. As, as you pay only for what you use, which, which I mentioned earlier, and you're billed on effective capacity usage prior to, uh, to data reduction. And, you know, on-demand usage is, is billed at the standard rate, so there's no penalty, there's no, um, you know, punitive aspect of, of using on-demand capacity. Next slide. And, you know, the, the other component is reserve capacity. And it's offered at a discounted rate. So you can start with reserve capacity as low as, as 50 TIB, but you can uh, you know, set it higher based on your needs. You, you can raise that floor as many times as you need to throughout the, a specific term. And you know, another great thing, another flexibility aspect here is that term <laughs> is not extended, right? 
um, um, you know, once you you change your floor, I mean, the term will still end at the, at the set time. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that term, you can actually reduce your floor again if your capacity is, you know, more stable and predictable that time. But, you know, there are maybe sometimes when you exceed the reserve capacity, and that's when you would venture into the on-demand capacity. But all in all, um, you know, the model gives you more flexibility and to, to manage your costs. And, and, and an important thing to note here also is that this is not a CapEx versus OpEx situation. This is about financial flexibility, right? So the, the ability to dial your consumption up or down based on your needs, thus, you know, giving you the flexibility to invest in you know, modernization and, and, and transformation efforts because of that smaller upfront investment. All right, next slide. Real quickly, I wanna to touch on Pure One, which is our, our cloud-based storage management platform that comes with, with Pure as a Service. Um, you know, it pretty much just makes it easy for you to, to know what's going on with Pure as a Service. It's kind of like a, a single pane of glass where you can see <laughs> everything that's happening in, in your environment. Next slide. All right, so I'm on this whole flexibility role thing. Um, mm -hmm. So. You know, Pure as a Service is not just about financial flexibility. It's also about operational flexibility, which, Andrew, you touched on a second ago. But mm -hmm. let me go into a little bit more detail on that. With Pure as a Service, you know, uh, you, you can reduce your IT staffing workload and, and, and not just by removing the need to, to do extensive uh, usage planning and, and forecasting, but by making it easy to, to get everything up and running, you know, pretty, pretty quickly. We also... Um, are able to, to set policies, right, um, for, for how your environment is, is managed. So, so you, you know um, where you, you can be where you want to be as far as your software upgrade life cycle. For example, if you want to always have the most current software in place, that's where you can be. Or if you want to be in revision or, or two behind, you can do that as well. It's mm -hmm. your choice. Next slide. So another quick example of operational flexibility, you know, Pure as a Service, you, you can place it in your, um, your on-premise, you can place it on-premise, you can place it, you know, in, in a co-located or, or hosted facility, you can move it to the cloud with, with Cloud Block Store, which, which runs on top of AWS and, and, and soon Azure as well. Um, and then you can also attach your, your co-located Pure as a Service to your compute in the public cloud, and this gives you that whole um, multi-cloud option as well. Next slide. So now, as far as, as the customer experience, um, again, you know, our goal here was to deliver uh, a similar experience to that of a hyperscaler, you know, with low barrier to entry, um, the ability to start small and, and grow, easily grow over time. Um, and, and then, um, you know, of course, the, the financial flexibility piece of that is the cornerstone of, of Pure as a Service. But also, don't forget about another added benefit is, is, is that of the short-term contracts, which helps you to avoid vendor locking. You can have a contract as, as, as low as 12 months instead of the typical three to five years that you would have I mean, in this area. Um, and then one of the most important aspects of, of, of your pure service customer experience, something Andrew mentioned earlier also, the whole <laughs> seven nines of availability. So you're pretty much always up and running with that um, uh, uh, in, in, your, in, your, in your work case there. All right, one more slide. All right, I just really briefly wanted to touch on our uh, service catalog. Um, we have six service tiers that are basically designed to align better with you know, real enterprise workload requirements. And, and then, you know, one of the reasons for doing this here and, you know, to kind of share uh, pricing on these service tiers is we wanted to, you know, bring something to this industry that has never been seen before. That's complete transparency and granularity in pricing. So I'll close that. there, Andrew. Um, I know that was kind of a whirlwind, um, but <laughs> we have time for questions at the end. That's what we're here for. And the, the financial transparency here is one of the one of the hallmarks of the public cloud in some ways that we're aligning to give some of that cloud-like experience. So if you're thinking, hopefully you're thinking, it sounds like cool, pure stuff, technical flexibility, financial business. But what about if we want to wander up the stack a little bit? We want to move into compute. We want to move into networking. Okay, So this is where we have collaborated with Cisco. And we didn't start with, hmm, let's just start with put the pieces in a rack. We started with 
it's applications and applications matter. That's the purpose of infrastructure, whether it's meeting SLAs, it's running workloads quickly, not requiring forklift upgrades across the board. And looking at that from a day zero, day one, day two perspective, that's, you know, architect, implant, and day-to-day -day operations. But, you know, the kind of questions that you see here, these are the things that you are thinking about. That's what I used to think about as a customer. So if we, as we've looked at this landscape over the years, you know, historically, we have gone from reference architectures to CI to HCI to previous actual tech uh, webinar, actually whiteboarded some of this out kind of thing. But what we offer with FlashTech jointly with Cisco, we believe, offers you the best of each of those without trade-offs. The reason we say we can do that is that at core, while it is Cisco UCS servers, plus pure storage, plus Cisco networking, there's this underlying core foundation of statelessness that unifies these products in a unique way, that relative even in some cases to the other offerings that we may have jointly with other vendors. That's led to customers that have actually been able to do something like this. There's a lot of model numbers on this slide, but if you remember the previous one I talked about, you know, pure customers that have gone, you know, 10 years, updating every component of their storage array and modernizing without taking downtime for performance impact, the same ability going up the stack into the full stack computer arena. And even I think Arrow, we're, we can say we're working on some full stack as a service and flash stack as a service with Cisco here in this arena moving forward. So stay tuned for that. That leads into transformative business value, like it says there. Any, to any given time you see one of these slides, these might be numbers that apply to your organization or not. But I think the order of magnitude impact here is clear. Well, 46% lower is an order of magnitude, but call it dramatic impact, right? This is enough that usually when I talk to people, it's worth digging in. And it's about that core simplification under the covers, as well as that we built more on top from an application standpoint, from a management standpoint with Intersight, Cisco validated designs. That's what leads into, and you may remember this actually from the last webinar that we did with Actual Tech, actually with Cisco, with Eric Blonda from Cisco where we dove in really deeply into the core themes of Flash Stack around simplicity, flexibility, and speed. For the purposes of today, and to keep us on time, we're not going to go too deeply into those, but make sure to refer back to that webinar that's on demand from Actual Tech and Pure as well. But there's one last item that we wanted to leave you with, which is, at the very beginning, the agenda slide, we talked about facilitating your journey to a hybrid cloud. What I see often when I'm chatting with folks is they know they want to get more cloudy. Sometimes it's public cloud, sometimes it's hybrid, sometimes it's application refactoring. That's a lot of work. And without simplifying and stabilizing your existing environment, there can be too much firefighting to even let you do that. So we started thinking about what would an optimal hybrid cloud look like? You know, it's around security, it's around orchestration, it's around flexibility. And when you dive into FlashStack, what you'll see is it provides what we believe is the best foundation for a true hybrid cloud, that the performance is there, the availability is there, the cost and economics, as well as workload consolidation, security, and simplicity, so that we can simply help you simplify and stabilize your environment with a lot of technical and flex financial flexibility like we've been talking about, so that you can move in the direction that you know that you want to move to, that may be toward IT as a service, that may be toward operating these unified team, or even as separate teams. And, and we're not just saying this, because in the past I've had times where you see products on a slide and you're like, eh, people don't, the customer the vendor doesn't really want you to buy those, but they're on the slide. We as Pure and as Cisco have invested real engineering work in embracing cloud portability. You know, an example here would be Cloud Block Store for AWS and Azure. This is taking our flash array intellectual property, building a virtual storage array with some really hard engineering that can run out in AWS and Azure. So it's not just, uh, we're, we're saying it, we've got real pieces there, both to help you on-prem and facilitate where you want to go. Because by the end of it, it means that your data center looks something like this, which is just amazing, you know, kind of thing. I don't maybe go to Amazon and get some some cool light strips if you want to put them in your rack. But hey, it's a fun picture to end with. I think with that arrow, we are over to Q and A. We'll do a, a lightning round there, if you don't mind. Uh, you you might kind of volleying the first question and uh, sure. go through it. Actually, man, there's a great question that came in from from Jonathan, and you know. This is this is actually a common question, but it really does uh, uh, beg the you know an, an answer because it's about security. And so, mm -hmm. would you mind commenting a little bit more on you know security within peers of service as well as within your data center in general? Yeah. So one of the cool things about peers of service is that you can this can apply to your gear on prem, pure gear on prem. In which case, there's zero change in security profile, right? So you've got as a service kind of cloud like consumption capabilities on prem. 
very simply, no change to security profile. Even as we run out, say, with cloud block store in the cloud, there's actually software-based encryption and the same security profile because it's the same code base as flash array on-prem. So there's obviously a deeper answer there. But the fortunate thing is that you can start to move into cloudy type stuff without dramatic shifts in the security profile. I think there's one that I'm going to pick up and toss back to you if that's all right. So uh, sure. there was that great slide on the service catalog. Mm. Um, can you go a little bit more into detail on the pricing? Because I, I think we've been in lightning round mode there. So just add a little bit more. All right, cool. Yeah, I know I showed that slide really, really quickly. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the, the pricing portion of the service catalog, that is MSRP or, or list pricing, right? So um, that, oh, thank you for pulling it up. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's just kind of like the base pricing that you can start with. The, the, what you want to do here is, you know, if you're really interested in digging into a little bit more detail about the price and you want to go ahead and reach out and contact your your AE or, or, or your, your representative and they can take you, uh, you know, from this MSRP pricing more into um, pricing that will show the available discounts and promos that are going on. Again, that's just base pricing, but, um, you know, call talk to a, a, a pure as a a pure sure. representative. Yeah. sales teams. That's what they're here for. <laughs> this is why we do it live, you know, sometimes. So, hey, the um, the last one, I'll, I'll do it quickly, is uh, it, it's a common one. What's this be, being really, being very real? What's different about Flash Tech? Cisco's got other partnerships. So, uh, one, refer back to the previous actual tech webinar that we did. But, you know, we have great, very deep Cisco validated designs to be application centric. They're more current and more flexible than some of the other ones. There's co development around components such as Smart Config for more rapid setup, Intersight for management integration and actually being the first to launch that with Cisco. So there's a good bit of unique stuff there. That's an awesome question. I can't do it justice in the time that we have, but but I didn't want to ignore it, at least in case folks are wondering there. With that, I think we will bring it home. Errol, thank you much so much for joining me today. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Actual tech, I would love to turn it back over. Thanks. All right, awesome presentation, Andrew and Errol. Thank you so much. Uh, really love the video there, really love seeing your faces and hearing the pure as a service story. For everyone out there, I've just brought up the poll question that says, what additional information would you like about the pure storage solution? And while we don't have uh, time left here in our session for live Q&A, uh, hope, hopefully everyone has seen that Andrew and Errol are in the chat there, or in the questions tab. They're answering your questions as quickly as possible. Uh, so appreciate that from the Pure team. Uh, and I'll leave this poll up. Uh, keep those good questions coming in. Don't forget our forget about our best questions prize. So uh, I'll leave this poll question up while I announce our next prize winners. We have another Amazon $500 gift card. And that's going out to Stephanie McKittish from Washington, DC. Congratulations, Stephanie McKittish from Washington, DC. Still one more uh, Amazon $500 gift card to give out on the event today. Uh, again, keep those good questions coming in for Pure. I am rapidly assigning them over to Andrew and Errol. Uh, thank you for the excellent answers, guys. Do appreciate that. I wanna remind everyone, of course, about the Handouts tab. In the Handouts tab, you'll find uh, full information, uh, a resource, on the storage as a service offering from Pure. Uh, so make sure that you check that out before you go. And with that, it's time to move on. If you haven't answered the poll question, now is the time to do it because we're moving on to our next presentation. And now I'm excited to introduce Chuck Wood, Senior Product Marketing Manager, and Simon Watkins, Worldwide Product Marketing Manager, both from Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Chuck and Simon, it's great to have you. Take it away. Well, thanks, David, and hi, everybody. It's Simon Watkins here from HPE uh, Worldwide Storage Marketing. I'm joined today by my partner in crime, Chuck Wood, and the objective of our session is to discuss how, when it comes to unleashing the power of data to transform your biz business, intelligence really does change everything. You know, it's our contention that you need to build intelligence into every layer of your infrastructure, and that definitely includes your storage. And as we'll see, the intelligence that's delivered with HPE storage really does have 
the power to transform your operations. So as we know, every business is looking to transform, whether that's to accelerate revenue, improve operational efficiency, or increase the speed of innovation. Now, data is the lifeblood of every business and is a key driver and enabler of this transformation. You know, leaders of today and tomorrow are data-driven, or at least they're trying to be data-driven. So what's holding you back? Well, the reality is that when it comes to unlocking the value and agility of data, a number of roadblocks stand in the way. Firstly, infrastructure complexity. This really is IT silent killer. It's, it's holding you back. Because when you look at IT infrastructure management and the complexity associated with it, you can have a very performant and reliable storage platform, but that's only addressing a fraction of the problem. You know, we know that greater than 90% of issues arise above the storage layer. You know, server network, virtualization stack issues can still impact the overall availability and performance of your apps. And there are hundreds or even thousands of variables that can contribute to application disruption, requiring millions of simulations to be done to correlate and pinpoint where issues are occurring within all of these layers. And this is a problem that's way too complex for humans to solve. Secondly, IT firefighting is slowing productivity. You know, whether you're being woken up in the middle of the night to resolve issues you didn't see coming, to day-to-day -day distractions that arise where you're having to manually tune and optimizing your environment. Once again, this too is a problem far too complex for humans to solve. And adding to these problems, there are data silos across core cloud and the edge, which are limiting agility, and skills and resource constraints are inhibiting innovation with the pressure to do more with less. So with all of these challenges, IT needs a way to remove these obstacles to free up resources to help advance their business as opposed to just administrating and keeping the lights on. So intelligence is key to solving these challenges, but meaningful intelligence has to go beyond just capacity forecasting and monitoring. It needs to be built on a bedrock of data, telemetry, algorithms, and data science. Mature intelligence, with the ability to correlate across all layers of infrastructure, including virtualization, compute, network, and storage, is the level of intelligence needed. HPE delivers this global intelligence with HPE InfoSight, which is the industry's most advanced AI for infrastructure, and which is available with all HPE infrastructure platforms spanning storage, networking, and compute. Now, the value of InfoSight, InfoSight starts with automatically predicting and proactively preventing issues before they occur, enabling an overall experience that our customers really love. But the value goes much further than that. So with a workload fingerprint, we can characterize the performance of your application workloads. And when we combine that with global learning, where we have over 150,000 systems that are calling home, spanning storage, HCI and servers and expand, extending all the way into the virtual machine layer, we can deliver prescriptive insights to keep the fleet of systems consistently optimized for our customers. And these insights are delivered not only for storage admins, but also extend to virtual machine admins as well. And Chuck will expand on this later in the session. So as other vendors are just recognizing the critical importance of intelligence and beginning to build up their capabilities, with HPE InfoSight, we've led the industry with breakthrough innovations, including predictive support, VM analytics, and prescriptive recommendations. So customers can simplify the operations and get out of fighting fires. And remember, you can't just get to AI-driven intelligence overnight, right? AI and machine learning requires massive amounts of data beyond the limited logs and metrics of traditional hardware platforms. HPE Nimble Storage, for example, was architected with deep diagnostic sensors, which cannot be easily retrofitted, right? And since, since InfoSight has been collecting data since 2010, its breadth of telemetry creates an architectural advantage that's difficult to catch up to. So since 2010, InfoSight has analyzed more than 1,250 trillion data points from over 150,000 systems and has saved customers more than 1.5 million hours of what would otherwise have been lost productivity due to downtime. 
So if you look at the outcomes enabled by this intelligence, it's no exaggeration to say that the benefits of InfoSight for our customers have been game changing. So if we look at HPE Primera, which is our enterprise storage platform, this platform is really raising the bar on mission critical reliability with 100% availability guarantee. And we can do this because intelligence allows Primera to predict and prevent issues before they occur, not just in the storage layer, but all the way up into the VM server layer. Secondly, we're seeing that intelligence is enabling operational savings and simplicity. For example, customers report 79% lower IT operational expenses with Nimble Storage due to the AI-enabled simplicity that Nimble provides from install to management to support to upgrade. And thirdly, we're transforming the customer experience with HPE InfoSight with 86% of issues opened and resolved automatically, not just for the storage array, but across the infrastructure stack. So a key benefit of AI-driven intelligence for our primary storage platform, so HPE Primera and HPE Nimble Storage, is that our customers don't have to trade off agility, resiliency. So in the world we live in today, every enterprise wants the agility, simplicity, and self-service of the public cloud, but are tied down to on-prem enterprise storage because they need resiliency and speed for their mission-critical apps. But this complexity of traditional enterprise storage is a real drain on IT productivity, requiring dedicated specialists to plan out new infrastructure, to constantly manage and tune performance, and with forklift upgrades being a complete nightmare and hassle. This forces a, a trade-off, uh, a sacrifice of agility for, for resiliency. And this really is where HPE storage is different. So HPE Primera and Nimble Storage overcome the agility versus reliability trade-off of the public cloud and traditional enterprise storage with AI-driven intelligence, data as services that extend to the cloud, and timeless ownership that eliminates forklift upgrades and ensures storage stays modern, all delivered uh, as a consumption experience through HPE GreenLake. So if you look at HPE Primera, Primera really did redefine high-end storage when we introduced it at the beginning of last year. It brings to market the world's most intelligent storage for mission-critical apps. This platform brings a simple, on-demand experience that gives IT back time previously spent deploying, managing, and upgrading storage. For example, over half of all Primeras have been self-installed by our customers often in as little as 20 minutes. Primera really raises the bar on resiliency and performance with 100% availability guarantees as standard for every array with standard support. And its unique data in place, non-disruptive upgrade with timeless refreshes delivers up to 40% TCO. Turning to Nimble Storage, Nimble celebrated its 10th anniversary last year. And looking back, it really has led the industry in innovation and disruption from intelligence to predictive support to hybrid cloud. Nimble Storage brings with it an extreme focus on simplicity, efficiency, and customer experience. It really sets it apart from every other mid-range storage platform in the, in, the, in the industry. And over the past 10 years, Nimble's delivered six nines of measured availability across its entire install base without the administrative overhead required of other storage platforms. It's also set the bar with its, its, its support experience, bringing predictive analytics that predict and prevent 86% of problems from storage to VMs. And finally, it enables direct access to level three support if help is ever needed. So with that, I'm gonna invite Chuck on to talk us through how intelligence is helping HPE to transform the ACI experience. Over to you, Chuck. Thanks, Simon. So here, I'm here today to talk about our hyperconverged portfolio and specifically HCI or hyperconverged infrastructure for virtualized workloads, including VMs and virtual desktop infrastructure is a key component of HPE's storage portfolio. This slide, similar to what Simon just showed you, highlights how customers benefit from our workload optimized solutions within our HCI portfolio. In our perspective, what customers should have is one simple HCI experience that addresses every virtualized workload from their edge sites all the way to their core sites, all the way to cloud. And HPE provides this unique capability with our portfolio. On the left side, we have one solution, SimpliVity, which is an all-in-one HCI 
that's edge optimized for locations in smaller sites or even outside of your data centers at your edges and remote sites. It provides two node HA, built-in protection and resiliency and no knobs to tune because it all comes pre-configured and very, very automated, allowing you to centrally manage not only one site, but dozens of sites from a single interface, namely vCenter. Second, in the core, we provide HPE Nimble Storage DHCI that's based on Nimble Storage that Simon just talked about. DHCI is a disaggregated HCI that is optimized for core sites, tuned for business critical and mixed workloads where you can uniquely scale compute and storage independently. Now above this is a unified management experience. And most importantly, above this is our global intelligence layer powered by HP InfoSight. And InfoSight, as Simon said, brings the power of AI and machine learning and it uniquely covers both these solutions to simplify and transform the support experience. So let's double click now into this global intelligence layer that Simon talked about and, and put it into real terms. How can VMs, VM admins benefit from the power of HP InfoSight? So this slide shows one practical example of what InfoSight provides you. And as we said, InfoSight is a SaaS portal. You can easily log into it at your site or even remotely. And it provides you with incredible global visibility across your entire infrastructure stack, not just your storage layer. And this slide in particular shows the full stack cross stack analytics that brings the power of HP InfoSight to you. It empowers admins to not only gain insights, but guides you to prescriptive troubleshooting to eliminate the guesswork and, and in essence, save you time. In this case, we've detected a performance issue with one of your VMs and your estate may have literally hundreds or thousands of VMs. And here we found one VM that's having a performance issue. It could be a, a, a various issues uh, causing that performance issue. In our case, through our deep telemetry and our knowledge engine, we've recognized that this, the issue to be resolved here is to reduce the vCPU counts for, this, for the VMs running on this specific host. And we give you the prescriptive solutions to that issue. And this has been a huge advantage to, to customers, not just diagnosing the storage issues, but actually giving you the, the resolution to solve this VM performance issue. Secondly, we show you deep visibility through InfoSight on your top consuming virtual machines and resources that they're consuming. As well, we identify the noisy neighbors or the troublesome VMs that are causing issues. And we can take, help you take corrective action to not only solve the performance issue of that given VM, but also save space and reclaim space with idle VMs that are consuming resources uh, that you can now reclaim and give back to your business. Another practical example was with a customer uh, who was having a business critical app that was seeing performance impacts and they couldn't get to the root cause. It was taking them weeks and months to try to find the needle in the haystack and, and they were in a firefighting mode to resolve this issue. Once InfoSight was brought to bear into this environment, we provided the full stack correlation from, this, from our insights, it wasn't a storage related issue. The problem exhibited as a VM performance issue, but it turned out a core networking switch setting was incorrectly set. And we gave that recommendation to fix that problem in, a, in another area of the stack and the problem was quickly resolved. So this clearly illustrated time savings given back to the VM admins and the business. As well, as we've said, HP InfoSight is global. It's global in scope. So it's looking at all of your connected systems, be they storage or our hyper-converged infrastructure solutions and gives you this visibility spanning many, many sites and provides you with predictive analytics and global visibility. In this case, we're showing that we have clusters in two different cities. We could have this spanning hundreds of cities and we show when you're going to be full 
the, the first cluster is no risk of the, being full, but the second is showing you that within three months on the course and speed you're on, you're gonna be full in, in terms of data. So you can now take corrective action to either reclaim space or add pools or add resources to your pool to satisfy the, the business issue. So with that, that's a few examples of how InfoSight really gives you power to the VM admin and your administrators to simplify operations. And many of our customers say InfoSight gives, it's like an extra pair of people in their environment, giving them tools to simplify the environment uh, and allow them to, to work on more strategic initiatives. And finally, ultimately, it provides you with a better overall support experience through our predictive analytics, our wellness capabilities, root cause determination. It overall transforms the support experience and our customers really benefit from this, uh, this overall unique capability. So with that, thanks for the time today. We hope this information has been valuable. And to learn more about HP storage, check us out at these links, including hp.com slash infosite and the others you see here. Thanks for the time. All right, excellent presentation. Thank you so much, Chuck and Simon. Uh, I've just brought up a poll question for everyone out there in the audience. I wanna call your attention to that on the screen. What additional information would you like about the HPE solution? Uh, there's obviously a lot of in interest about this uh, solution in the questions tab there. So we appreciate the good questions. Keep them coming. And don't forget about our best question prize that we're running for each session. So get your question in. Um, Chuck and Simon, are you there for some Q&A? Yes, hello, David, can you hear us? Yeah, hey, Chuck. Hey, David, Simon. hello. Hey there, hey, David. Simon here as well. Hey, Simon, great yeah. to have you guys. Hey, David. Yeah, so uh, great presentation. Uh, we do have some questions here for you from the audience. Uh, first one, I think this one's for you, Chuck. Uh, let's see, they're asking, oh, I lost it, here it is, okay. Um, they're asking uh, about HPE InfoSight licensing. Uh, how does that work? And is, is there an option that's purchased separately from storage? Yeah, so the great question. So the, the fact of the matter is it's all included. When you buy an HPE storage product, along with the maintenance, you get InfoSight for free. It's, so it's included. There's no add-on licenses. There's no software SKUs you have to purchase. There's no capacity license. So if you buy a, an HPE Primera, if you buy an HP Nimble solution, HP SimpliVity, HP Nimble Storage DATI, any of our software uh, storage products, you get InfoSight. And the beauty of it is all you need is a web browser and internet access, and you can log into the SaaS portal, InfoSight at HPE.com. You can go there now and see it, but unless you have our products, you can't actually get credentialed to log in and get all the benefits of our AI-driven intelligence. But great question. Yeah, absolutely. seems like a really powerful tool that could help so many companies out there with, with storage management and storage efficiency and, you know, uh, troubleshooting and proactive, uh, proactively preventing problems before they happen. So, yeah, it seems like a great resource. Uh, it's excellent to hear that it's included uh, with HPE Storage Solutions. Uh, next question, I think this one's for you, Simon. They're asking, uh, can you provide some details on any of the newer features uh, that have been released around the HPE InfoSight solution? Uh, newer features, yes. Yeah, so, so I guess as we discussed and, and showed um, during the presentation, one of the most valued features of InfoSight is cross-stack analytics in, in VMware environments. And we recently announced the value of this, um, we actually advanced the value of this capability yet further with the announcement that InfoSight for Nimble Storage and Nimble Storage DHEI has added support for Hyper-V. So, so Microsoft customers, in addition to VMware customers, will now have a complete visibility across their environments with the, the ability to ease and pinpoint uh, and root cause performance issues between storage and VMs, as well as to identify kind of underutilized virtual resources, among other, among other capabilities. Very cool, yeah. Exciting new features, uh, support for Hyper-V, a lot of other uh, new features always being released. Uh, great to hear that you guys keep innovating around the InfoSight solution. Uh, and then another question mm -hmm. here, they're asking, how does HPE InfoSight compare to other competitive offerings in the industry? 
Yeah, so, so, so I guess we touched on this in the presentation. I mean, InfoSight has been a pioneer when it comes to predictive analytics for, for almost a decade now. And I think it's fair to say it remains today the industry's most mature and advanced AI for infrastructure. And I think many of our storage competitors have tried to emulate it, but I think InfoSight still leads the way across many vectors. And, and I'll highlight just three. So firstly, if you look at the depth and breadth of telemetry that you get with InfoSight, I mean, as we know, AI and machine learning requires massive amounts of data to be of value. And every second, InfoSight collects and analyzes data, analyzes data from more than 150 systems worldwide. And that's across storage, across compute, and the virtualization layer. And it's been doing that for many years now. And it uses that intelligence and those trillions of data points to make every system smarter and more self-sufficient. And I think no other storage vendor really offers the breadth and depth of telemetry data that you get with InfoSight. That's number one. The second uh, differentiator I would highlight, and Chuck talked about this in his presentation, was InfoSight's AI recommendation engine. So I think while some vendors only look at the arrays in isolation, the prescriptive, actionable recommendations that you get across the stack with InfoSight go way further than the competition. And thirdly, I'd highlight the support experience that InfoSight enables for nimble customers. So that predictive support information with InfoSight eliminates level one and level two support. So nimble customers get direct access to expert level three technical support engineers. And when you remove that complexity of you know, tiered traditional support models, you get less time spent resolving story graded trouble tickets, you have faster time resolution. And also you get a world-class support experience and you uniquely get that as standard as a nimble storage and nimble storage DHCI customer. Excellent. And so a uh, final question probably that we have time for, and that is uh, what should people do to get started with this solution? Chuck, you want to answer that? Uh, well, like I said, I mean, just to see it, you know, the, you can go to infosite.hpe.com. You won't be able to log in, but you can at least see the SAS portal and, and some of the information. Go to our website, in fact, one person, at, and check out uh, all the HPE products from a solution perspective, and you'll see AI and InfoSight uh, woven into the solution pages. There's an there's a InfoSight page itself you can check out. Uh, one of the other questions, just quickly, David, someone asked, how does HPE back up our 100% guarantee? Just go to the Primero, HPE Primero website. At the top of the page, you'll see a uh, a guarantee that includes information about the 100% availability guarantee. But there's a lot of information about InfoSight at hpe.com for you to get educated on, including content, but also videos. So check it out. Excellent. Uh, HPE InfoSight page, 100% guarantee. That It doesn't get better than 100% guarantee. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I'm afraid that's all the time we have. A great way to, to wrap up the event today. Uh, Chuck and Simon, thank you so much for your presentation. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. Perfect. Thank you. All right. And thank you to everyone out there in the audience. Uh, don't forget to answer the poll question there. And also on the handouts tab, that'll take you to the HPE uh, Nimble story, uh, Storage Customer Success uh, video uh, for more information as well. All right. So I'll just leave up the poll question while I announce our final prize winner. We have an Amazon $500 gift card going to Joshua Longiaro, Longiaro from Connecticut. Congratulations, Joshua Longiaro from Connecticut. I will post the prize winners in the questions tab as well. All right, those are in the questions tab. Um, before you go, I want to remind everyone out there to check us out on social media. Actual Tech Media's 10 on Tech podcast is in the iTunes store. Uh, you can subscribe to all of our social media channels, uh, but especially our LinkedIn page uh, is where we post all of our latest and greatest content. So make sure that you check us out there. If you are a potential sponsor of an upcoming event, reach out to us at connect at actualtechmedia.com. We would love to chat about having you on. And finally, I hope that you'll join us for our upcoming security megacast on up-leveling your security and networking capabilities uh, on that event, we'll be giving out five Apple M1 MacBook Airs, awesome, some awesome new machines, 
and you'll hear from all of the uh, expert presenters uh, that you see there on the screen, experts from Net & Rich, Gigamon, Firemon, Alkira, Note Before, Rapid7, and Progress. Uh, that is happening next week, so we hope to see you there. I hope that you learned a lot on today's Storage Ecocast event on scanning the modern storage landscape from arrays to software to integrated systems and more. Uh, I know I learned a lot. I hope that you have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.